Good afternoon, everyone. It's one o'clock in Pasadena. It's four o'clock in Paramus, New Jersey. I'm Joe Abadi, and you're listening to Vintage Motocross Radio. In a moment, I'll be telling you more about my guest, Rick Smiths. But right now, I'd like to thank our sponsors who make the show possible. Vinco, keep the ride going with over 650 products in their catalog. Motion Pro for all your specialized tools, cables, and controls. Golden Products, check out their fuel filters and learn more about how to become a Golden Products distributor. Full Circle Racing Limited for vintage and modern rim spokes, lacing, and truing. Northwest Mako CZ, thank you, Alan Brown, for all you do for us here at the show. Preston Petty Products, the legend continues. Racer X Magazine, available online and on your newsstands now. Sunrise Vapor Blasting of Modesto, and a special thanks to Kevin Bridges and the Dirt Diggers North Motorcycle Club. My guest this morning hails from the Netherlands, but found his way to America to attend college in New York State. In 1986, he led Marist to the Metro Conference Tournament Championship and advanced to play in their first NCAA tournament in school history. He led the Red Foxes to 20 wins for the first time in its Division I history. As a professional basketball player, he spent his entire career with the Indiana Pacers. He was drafted by the Pacers with a second overall pick in the 1988 draft. A few quick statistics show that he scored nearly 13,000 points had over 5,200 rebounds, and blocked 1,111 shots. He was also a member of the 1998 NBA All-Star Team, and he's a vintage off-road motorcycle enthusiast with an amazing collection of bikes, a wonderful ambassador to the sport of vintage motocross. It's my pleasure to have as my guest this afternoon, the Duncan Dutchman, Mr. Rick Smith. Rick, thank you for joining me today. Hey, Joe, my pleasure, man. Uh, I'm looking forward to this. Uh, your countryman, Garrett Walsink, sends his regards. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, I, uh, I met him a few years uh, ago in uh, in Vegas at the uh, one of the Meekum auctions. Mm -hmm. now, of course, I'd heard about him, but I uh, never met him in person. So that was, uh, yeah, that was cool. I enjoyed that. You know, while we're, while we're just talking about that, Rick, did you and Garrett not live far away from each other in the Netherlands? I'm not sure where he grew up. Okay. Uh, of course, I've heard about him, but yeah, I don't remember what, uh, what town the... Uh, Okay. Hey, Rick, we're going to be talking a lot about motocross in our conversation. Uh, but for a few minutes, I have to talk about how you got involved in basketball. Um, did, did you begin in grade school, Rick? And when did you realize you had a talent for the game? Uh, wow. Uh, yeah, I, uh, I actually started when I was uh, 14. Uh, and I, I tried a bunch of different sports at that time. I, you know, I did rugby, I did soccer, judo, track and field. Nothing really that uh, you know, that I enjoyed very much and that I stayed with uh, until I found basketball. I see. And it was it was actually my mom. She was playing for a club team. You know, over there everything is club teams. You know, not, it's not in the schools. It's, oh. Uh, you know, all, all club team that organizes different sports. <laughs> So her her club had a, a party that I intended, and uh, some guy came up to me and said, "Hey, Rick, have you thought about playing basketball?" He said, "I just started a, a junior team for that particular club." He said, "No, I never really thought about it." He said, "Why don't you come and give it a try?" And you know, it was pretty much uh, you know, right from the beginning. I enjoyed it. I actually could put my uh, my height to good use, mm -hmm. and uh, of course that helped. And uh, you know, it wasn't until by 16, 17, when I, when I realized, hey, you know, I could actually go somewhere with this. Sure. You know, it took me a couple of years to get into it. You know, Rick, I, I wondered, how, how did you wind up at Marist College in New York? I got a couple of friends of mine whose children have gone there. Uh, Jerry Cantone is one of them. But how did you end up at Marist College in New York? Was there a scout in the Netherlands? How did they find you? Uh, well, um, when I was 16, I had a friend uh, that, that also played for that club, as I mentioned earlier, and he had come back from the United States. He was in the, uh, you know, one of the uh, teams with the older players. And he was all gone home about the United States. He just finished college and uh, you know, he had a hell of a time. You know, he, he loved it here. Mm -hmm. so I thought to myself, hey, maybe that's something for me. So I reached out to a couple of different organizations in the United States at the time. I wrote some some letters, and uh, you know I, I heard back from the, from them, and I had a couple of coaches call me and talk to me, uh, but nothing really came off of it. And uh, even though I was you know I was probably seven two, seven three at the time, 
know, they really didn't know, uh, you know what I should be doing. Or they didn't really know, you know where to send me. But at the same time, I had a uh, another friend that say, said, told me, he said, hey, there's a coach coming to watch a couple of players on another team that was in a town over from us. They said, you should come out there and, you know, and uh, introduce yourself to this coach. So that's what I did. I, uh, I went over uh, to the next town. It was about 30 minutes away, and I introduced myself to this coach. Uh, of course, he saw that's all I was, and he offered me a scholarship without even having seen me play. Wow. So that was pretty cool. And yeah, he ended up being a marriage coach. He was, uh, the year before, he was coaching in France, but got the marriage job. So he wanted to take some European players with him. He ended up getting a kid from Yugoslavia, a kid from France, and then myself. Very interesting. And was that your first trip to America? Yeah, it was my first trip. Uh, yeah, I loved it for the second I arrived. That's fantastic. Hey, you know, Rick, yeah. you, you were you were the second pick in the first round of the NBA draft in '88 behind Danny Manning, and you spent your entire career at the Pacers. So you wind up in Marist, but when draft time came, were you hoping that maybe a different team would draft you? Uh, no, I, uh, I actually, uh, you know, I visited probably the top five teams that, you know, that, 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 that had the top five picks that year. Uh -huh. You know, you do workouts with them, you know, you meet people in the organization, they have you do all kinds of testing and stuff. And, you know, I, uh, I really enjoyed uh, Indiana. I mean, they were they were the most professional. I uh, really felt at home there. You know, I'm not really a big city guy. Right. Uh, you know, Indiana is you know it's it's got that small town feel, and and I liked it. So I was yeah I was ecstatic when they picked me. I uh, yeah I really uh, I was really happy about that. So during your college, uh, but you know, obviously before your professional career, you you must have followed the game. Who were some of the players that you looked up to? You know, either during your time at Marist or before your college days? Uh, I really never had a real hero to look up to. Uh, you know, if I had to pick somebody, I guess it would be you know, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Mm -hmm. You know, seven foot two, played the same position as I did. You know, you know, of course, he was an all-star pretty much every year he played. Yeah, so I guess it, uh, if I had to pick somebody, it would be him. Kareem, sure. And yeah. um, let me ask you this, Rick. I... Uh, we, I mean, we could talk about basketball. You know, we, we could talk about this all day, but I'm sure our listeners, uh, the Vintage Motocross guys, they, they want to move on and talk a little bit more about um, what you, you know, what you have as far as motorcycles go and how you got started with that. So when, when, did, this, uh, when did this motorcycle bug begin? Because I saw a picture of you on a KTM in the Netherlands as a teenager. So when did the motorcycle thing first start? Well, that started at age seven. Really? Uh, my grandpa on, the, on my mom's side had a uh, had a fifty cc Barini. It's uh, probably some some you know it's a brand that not many people are familiar with. Uh, it's basically a moped. You know, everybody over there you know rides mopeds. You know, when you get when you get to turn sixteen, you get to ride a moped. Mm -hmm. And you know, my grandpa, and grandma, they both had mopeds. But anyway, his his moped got stolen. Uh, he got a new moped. You know, months later, they located his old one, and it had been it had been stripped down. You know, they, some kids call it. You know, use it as a little dirt bike to go trail riding. Well, somehow my grandpa got it back and, and gave it to me. And that was at age seven, and yeah, that, that's how it got started. So, what was you some know? what were some bikes you had after that? Uh, well, I had all kinds of bikes. We. Uh, couple guys in, in, in my neighborhood, you know, they were into mopeds and bikes. And, you know, we started buying and selling and, you know, I probably, before I got to the United States, I probably already had, you know, 30, 40 different, uh, different bikes. Very interesting. That, K, that KTM you saw, that was actually during college when I came back, some reporter was doing a story on me and, uh, and I had still had that KTM over there. So I took it out in the street and they took pictures of me, you know, riding that thing without a helmet street uh, that was like i think like a 79 or an 80 250 or something who's the uh other young lady in the picture with you in that shot do you remember mm, oh then uh, yeah there's a couple that might be my sister is there is there two different bikes in that picture uh yes there is she's sitting on one you're sitting on the ktm yeah yeah, yeah. okay yeah 
Okay, that's uh, yeah. That was like a little homemade mini bike I made with a uh, with a Zundup three speed forced air induction cooled engine. That's uh, that's my uh, my younger sister. I see. Now you uh, you apparently are a hands on guy when it comes to mechanics. You were working on bikes back then too, huh? Yeah, I tried. <laughs> yeah, looking back, you know, we uh, I didn't have much money, so we I didn't have any tools. You know, my my dad's tool chest was limited, so we. Uh, we let a lot of bikes go just because I couldn't get the Magneto off because I didn't have a puller and stuff. You know, I'd buy a bike and had no spark, couldn't get it going. I'd, you know, I'd sell it or trade it uh, for next to nothing and then uh, you know, move on to the next one. Now, you had the KTM there. You're obviously involved with motorcycles. Netherlands was a pretty rich country as far as good motocross riders go. You had Walsink and Karsmakers, to name a few. Did you follow motocross back then, Rick? Did you go to any races? I never did go to any races. You know, we'd, we'd hear about guys, but it, you know, I really don't remember seeing anything on TV or anything like that. Uh, no, unfortunately, I never got to make it to a to a race until later on, and uh, you know, when I uh, when I came back after my uh, pro career had started. I see. Now, I, I did ask a question. Actually, it wasn't a question, but you just mentioned a little while ago about your uncle's moped being stolen and you getting it back. Because my next question was about what family member or who was it that you knew that influenced you uh, to get involved early on? But I guess it was your uncle. No, no, it was my grandpa. Oh, my your grandpa. Side. I'm sorry. Yeah, my grandpa. Yeah, yeah. So he, uh, yeah, he got me started. <laughs> okay. Um, so while you're at, when, when you get back from college, are, are you still going back to the Netherlands during the off season? Is there motorcycles involved in your life then? Uh, yeah, I actually bought uh, a Honda XL350 one summer my junior year, I think, in college. Okay. And uh, I think later that summer, I ended up getting a XL600. So uh, at the time, I was dating a, a girl that lived in upstate New York, which is actually where I'm still at in this town. I'm no longer dating the girl, but uh, <laughs> anyway, there, there was lots of riding up here. And her brother had a dirt bike, so I bought this dirt bike one summer and just left it up here. And, uh, you know, we did a lot of riding here in upstate New York. Now, you're up in Walton, Rick? Yes, Walton, uh, New York. Okay, now, for those, I guess, that are listening, I kind of know that area. It's like halfway between Roscoe and Unadilla. Yes, yes, that's right. Yeah. yeah. Um, how soon after your NBA career ended did you begin racing vintage bikes? Quit in 2000, and I'm not sure if it was two, the year 2000 or 2001 when I started racing vintage. I had a, uh, a buddy that uh, I was going to a race in Tennessee, Owenwell, Tennessee. Mm -hmm. And he said, Hey, why don't you travel along with me and uh, you know come check out this race? And when I got there, you know, I'd seen all these old bikes, and I was like, Man, this is really cool, you know. So he said, well, if you really want to, I, you know, we can get a pit bike. Or his pit bike was like a Yamaha 250, a vintage, I forget what year it was, 74, 75. He said, take that if you want. You know, and I was, I was really unprepared. You know, I had this crown of helmet. I, uh, you know, I had my sneakers on. Uh, we found some word gloss. We, you know, we cut the fingers off, and uh, <laughs> I, I gave it a try. Uh, of course, I was a novice. I ended up winning my class. And that was it. I was hooked from then on. I see. Hey, um, so you begin racing armor. That's like 2002. Um, after that ride on the Yamaha, what what other classes did you did you ride in, Rick? Um, yeah, I did the hair scrambles, and then I started motocross. Mm -hmm. And uh, I even did some trials for a while. Um, yeah, I probably raced the uh, GPs classes, the H classes. You know, and then, that, and then the hair scrambles. Uh, the hair scrambles was mostly post spinach, I believe. I don't think I ever did any vintage hair scrambles. Yeah. You know, I, we often see you competing on a 490 Mako, sometimes on the shorter travel bikes as well. Uh, but I also saw you riding some old four strokes in the Premier class. Why did you choose that? Do you like the old four strokes? Let's talk about those bikes for a minute. Yeah, I don't remember how I got started on the, on the Premier. Uh, well, I'll take that back. I, I think it was Bino Rodi mm -hmm. that let me ride one of his big triumphs. He had like a 750 Triumph or something. And it was, you know, it was a completely different sensation than anything I've ever ridden before. Right. 
that I thought that was pretty cool. So somehow I knew I found out about Dick Mann and how he was building bikes, and I said, "Well, that'd be pretty cool to let you know let a legend build me a bike." So I said, "All right, go ahead and build me a bike." And that was you know at the time was the most money I ever spent on a motorcycle. Mm-hmm. But but I'm glad I did. You know, and the uh, he built me a BSA Gold Star 500, and, you know, a Rickman Matisse frame. And I raced that quite a bit, and I still race it. Every once in a while, I get it out. Uh, it's in, in Arizona right now. I'll, I'll race it some there. So you have a you have a Dick Man built bike. That's really really incredible. Of course, Dick passed away uh, in April. I just went to his celebration of life uh, yesterday. Uh, there were probably close to eight hundred people there. But that's wonderful that you have a real Dick Man bike. Yeah, I'm not, you know, I'll never let that go. That's, uh, you know, that's one of my favorite bikes. What have, uh, what have some of your other favorite bikes that you've raced over the years? Uh, man, you know, <laughs> I like all kinds of bikes, but yeah. if I had to pick, you know, my favorite band is probably Zundop. Uh, I, I never race any of them, but it's, you know, it's the kind of bike that, uh, that I always wanted and I always liked when I was growing up, mm-hmm. you know. Uh, back then, as a kid, 10, 11, 12 years old, I would get these magazines or these catalogs that would list, you know, all the bikes for that year coming out, you know, in the 80s. And, you know, Zundup was always my favorite one. So when yeah. I came here, you know, and it, it was probably three or four years in uh, the United States when I realized, holy cow, and Zundup actually, you know, imported bikes. You know, they had the MC, the GSs. Uh, you know, they had a few other models here, and you know, when I realized that, that's when I uh, when I started looking for them. You know, Rick, maybe you can answer a question for me because I really don't know the answer to it. Of course, I'm familiar with the Zundop, the 125s and 250, but did they put any bigger engines in those bikes too? Uh, well, they had the old, the, uh, the real old ones, had the 750, uh, maybe in the, even a 350. You know, that was in the you know the 40s and the 50s. Mm-hmm. Uh, I really like the you know late '60s and up. You know, I think they uh, they went bankrupt in '84. Uh, but you know, the, the, the kind you find here are from the late '60s to the early '70s. Right. You know, I don't, I don't I don't think they imported anything after that. How many Zundops do you own right now? Well, uh, I'd say 25 between 25 and 30. Wow. Uh, you know, a lot of them are what? Just original bikes? Do you have any, you know, NOS bikes? Uh, I've had some NOS bikes. I, I go through these stages where, <laughs> where I, uh, I end up selling a bunch. You know, I always end up regretting them. But, uh, yeah, I found a, a couple of uh, KS125s, which is a road version, that were brand new. One was in the crates and one was just bought and, you know, sat in the living room all its life. Uh, I, you know, I regret selling those, but, uh, oh, well, you know, it gave me room to put another bike in its spot. Sure. But, uh, yeah, uh, some, you know, some Zundaps have restored, uh, you know, most of them are just original still. What about Makos? I bet you got a lot of 490 Makos there, huh? Uh, well, I've had a bunch over the years, you know, back when I was, uh, when I was racing Arma, you know, of course, I, you know, we go to the races, I <laughs> bring a backup bike for every class, basically. <laughs> you know, oh, anytime I see an extra Mako for sale, I would buy one. So at one point, I think I had like twenty four ninety Makos, but mm-hmm. uh, I'm, I'm down to five right now. Who do you so, buy? Who do you buy most of your parts from for those Makos? Uh, wherever I can. Uh, lately, I've been buying some from uh, Allen at Northwest. Um, the guy by Fritz Gunther in uh, yeah, in sure. North- West, he, he's done some work on one of my engines here recently, and he got me some parts. Yeah. So John at Canadian Mako uh, bought some parts overseas in England. That's, so that's, uh, that, yeah, you definitely need to keep buying parts for those bikes. That's for sure. <laughs> and, you know, I, I mean, I asked that question out of the clear blue, but I'm glad you said Alan Brown from Northwest Mako ZZ. He is a sponsor of the show, and Fritz Gunther is a good friend, too. So it's uh, yeah. it's it's good to know that you're uh, – you're supporting those guys now. What about modern bikes, Rick? You got anything in your garage as far as modern bikes go? Yeah, uh, I really like my KTM's. I got uh, a couple of 500s, and then I just bought a uh, new 300, a 2022 300 XCW. Uh, be my first two-stroke with the fuel injection. So I'm trying to set it up yet. You know, make the modifications so I get comfortable on it. Do you yeah, just? 
do you ride in the ice and that? Yeah. Do, do you just ride the dual purpose bikes or do you have an actual street bike too? Uh, I have some street bikes, but uh, yeah, I do I do very little street riding. Yeah. It's just you know, it's just, it's just too crazy, especially in Arizona. You know, oh my gosh, I, I would not I can't. Uh, I don't feel comfortable out on the street. There's just too many idiots out there not paying attention. So I, uh, I do very little street riding. I understand. I've been riding motorcycles a long time too. I've never owned the. I mean, I've I've owned the street bike. I have ridden on the street uh, momentarily, but I never went out, registered the bike, got a license, and went that route. And uh, yeah, it's just uh, it's just not a place that I that I feel comfortable. Now I know you've got some other unusual bikes too, um, like a Hercules. Tell me about some of the other bikes that you have that probably most people don't have in their collections, or maybe some people haven't even heard of. Wow, let's see. Yeah, the Hercules, uh, you know, I, I always like my German bikes, mm -hmm. my small board German bikes. It goes back to, you know, what I was saying about the Zundaps earlier, me looking at these catalogs and, and looking at what came out that year. Somehow I ended up buying a, a, a small Hercules collection uh, soon after I retired from basketball. And of course, you know, I start restoring them and I buy more Hercules and you know, I have fine parts, I'll buy some parts for them and, you know, some, some parts inventories and stuff like that. So I've got a lot of uh, Hercules GSs from, you know, 77, 78, but the, uh, the seven speed engines. Okay. Uh, well, I still got about nine of them. Three of them are restored and six of them are being restored. Uh, I've also got a Hercules Winkle, which is a street street bike it's a yeah. 76 uh i think it's a w2000 they call it it's got the uh yeah the wankel motor which is uh, it's kind of cool i i really enjoy riding that uh i don't ride it much as i said i don't really like going out on the street but uh, i ride up and down the road every once in a while what about patents you got a bunch of patents uh i've had a bunch in the past currently i don't have any oh okay currently i'm out of them so uh Got a few Italian bikes. I got a uh, couple Fantics. Uh, I got a nice original Caballero. It's just a. It's actually a 50 cc, uh, but all original. You're an enduro bike. It's uh, one of my favorite 50 ccs. I got. Uh, I got a Gilera 50 cc. Oh, uh, let's see. So you're, uh, yeah, it looks like you really favor the, the Italian and, and German marks. And uh, yeah, they, they made some, some beautiful motorcycles. Now with these, with these Hercules and maybe certain Pentons and other ones, is there, is there any part in particular that you have a problem hunting down that you haven't found yet? No, nothing. Uh, I've been lucky that way, I guess. Uh, there's, there's nothing at the moment I'm looking for that I haven't been able to find. So, oh. uh, I know it's getting harder and harder to find stuff. You know, I hear from people all the time. Uh, but no, I've been, I've been lucky, I guess. Okay. Well, that uh, that is very fortunate for you because parts are drying up. And I know as, as I'm doing restorations and stuff like that, sometimes you don't restore certain bikes for a couple of years. And you remember the last time you went out and bought something for that bike and you go out this time and the cost is three times the amount, yeah. uh, maybe more. Who knows? Uh, Rick, you, when we were talking on the phone the other day, you said you were upstate, which you kind of confirmed before you said you were laying out a track for an event. Um, where is that event? What were you doing there? Uh, actually that's, uh, that's for a, a local dual sport. It's the, uh, the Bear Creek, uh, uh sportsman that, uh, lay out a, uh, two day dual sport in Hancock, New York, mm -hmm. uh, a few years ago at the, uh, the world enduro here. But it's, uh, it's, I think they've been going for 20 some years. It's, uh, it's always a fun dual sport. It's, it's pretty challenging. Right. Um, you know, a lot of guys from New York or from New Jersey come up for it. There's, I think they've already gotten 600 uh, people signed up. So, uh, one of my friends kind of started that deal. Uh, he's up in this area, just a town over. So I, I helped him out for the last couple of days, uh, clearing trail, marking trail. And just making sure everything is going to be lined up for uh, August. I think it's August 7th and 8th. So not this coming weekend, but the weekend after that. What are some other clubs you've worked with over the years, Rick? I, I see you out there setting up tracks and, and always helping out uh, some of the armor clubs and some of the other independent clubs. Who are some of the other ones you help out and work with? 
Oh, I'll try to help out wherever, wherever's needed. But uh, in Arizona, I'm part of the Arizona Trail Riders. Mm-hmm. And, uh, they do a lot of good things. We uh, we have a big dual sport every year. And then we also have a uh, race at uh, Camp Wood every year, which is north of Crestwood. And, uh, yeah, so I just, uh, I just try to help out wherever, wherever I can. Now, you, you said you have some bikes being restored, but I know you're a hands-on guy. What, what are some bikes that you personally restored? Uh, yeah, currently I don't have many bikes being restored. Oh, okay. uh, I, did, uh, I usually try to do my own work. I did send off an engine to Fritz Gunther over the winter time uh, to get him uh, take another look at it. Yeah, I'm not the best at <laughs> everything I try, but I'm, I'm, I know I'm not the best. There's always somebody better out there. Sure. But I've, uh, I've restored a bunch of Hercules, as I said earlier, the 77 seven speeds. I probably restored eight of those. Um, I've restored some Zundops, uh, a bunch of DKWs, and then let's see. Uh, I did some trials bikes. I had a, uh, a little 175 Yamaha trial bike that I restored. Wow, let's see. Uh, actually, the ones I'm working on now, I'm working on a scooter. It's a uh, 1955 Glass Go-Go. It's uh, not a scooter that was imported in the United States, but uh, somebody had bought it in privately. Very unique. I've, I've never seen another one in the United States. I'm sure there are a couple. But it's just an uh, old scooter, 200cc, you know, big, big body work on it. Very I- different. I remember seeing you getting involved with scooters at the Mika Motorcycle Auction a few years ago. You were either buying or selling some scooters there. Could be, could be, yes. Yeah. Okay, let's yeah. let's let's talk about this, Rick. I mean, you're a big guy. Obviously, I would imagine it's very difficult to find motocross boots. How do you deal with that? <laughs> yeah, I've got very lucky. Uh, back when I first started the finish races, as I said, I was racing there by sneakers. Right. Oh, I remember being at a race in uh, Casey, Illinois, and the owners of the track, Gene Renzi and his wife, they came up to me and said, hey, Rick, this is, this is not good. This is not good for, for you, you know, race with your sneakers. So they said, we might be able to hook you up with somebody that can help you out. So they actually hooked me up with Roger DeCoster, and Roger had a connection with Alpine Stars. And Alpine started ended up making me a set of boots. Well, the, the, the funny thing was, you know, I, I during my playing career, I had some uh, <clears throat> cowboy boots made and, and just some different shoes custom made. Mm-hmm. And I had learned that, you know, when they, they want an outline of your foot, so I would send them a perfect outline of my foot, and the, the boots or the shoe always came back too small. So when I used to do it, I go, you know, Maybe like 10 millimeters to the left, 10 millimeters taller. You know, I just kind of did a very, uh, you know, it went way bigger than my foot actually was. Yeah. So I had this outline way bigger than my foot was. I figured, oh, I'll set up the F5 stars. So I did. And a couple months later, they sent me a pair of boots and they looked great, but they are way too big. You know, they're actually the size of my drawing. Oh. So around that same time, they had the, uh, dealer show the, uh, in Indianapolis. The motorcycle dealer show used to be there. And uh, I always had a buddy that let me in the door. So I was going through the show and Garnet was set up over there with a, uh, you know, with their display. I stopped by. I think it was Bob Rafkamp was there. And I talked to him and I said, hey, you think you guys can make me a pair of boots? I said, uh, Alpine Stars did it. Sure enough, you guys can do it too. So I said, "Yeah, yeah, I guess we can." And he, you know, of course, he wanted an outline of my feet. So I sent him for some reason. I sent him the same sec, same sec, exact same drawing that I had sent Alpine Stars. Four months later, I got a pair of boots that fit me perfectly, and he's he's been helping me out ever since. And I've probably been, you know, I've probably gone through a dozen boots or so, but they. Uh, Man, I, I sure was happy that uh, that they helped me out and that, that they, uh, they still are because they, uh, they fit me perfectly. Garnet, wow, that's an interesting story. And I guess, you know, the, the gear I see you wear, it looks like it comes from Don Miller at Metro. Yes, the finished gear, yeah, Don and uh, Peg have uh, always taken good care of me. They're, you know, they're my sponsors. I get free T-shirts, free gear from them all the time. So, uh, yeah, I want to give them a big shout-out today, and uh, I'm very, very grateful to have met them. 
Absolutely. Hey, Rick, you know, your passion for anything that burns gasoline doesn't begin and end with motorcycles. In a lot of pictures, I see that you have some Mopar cars. I saw you had some unusual vehicles, uh, trucks and Jeeps. Tell us, tell us about your car and, uh, and truck collection as well. What do you have there? Uh, well, yeah, I'm always kind of impartial to Mopars. It was the uh, uh, first collector car I owned was a uh, 69.5 Dodge Super B. And then at the same time, from the same guy, I bought a 1970 Plymouth Superbird. I've still got the Superbird. I sold the, uh, the Super B a long time ago. But uh, yeah, that was uh, probably late 80s when I started uh, getting into cars. I bought a couple 59 Cadillac convertibles at an auction one year. I've always just enjoyed uh, American cars because you know, growing up, we, you know, we had Fiats and Citroëns and Duffs. Sure. Very, very small cars. So I was always so, you know, so claustrophobic. I mean, not claustrophobic, but I, yeah, I was always you know, too big for those cars. And here I come to the United States and see these big, huge cars. And man, I just, I just fell in love with them and uh, still am. Now the Superbird you bought in the late eighties, you still own that car? Yes. Oh, yes, you, still got that. <laughs> you gotta be really happy about that. Oh yeah. That was, uh, <laughs> that was a good investment. I'm, I'm, I'm usually a guy that, uh, that seems to buy when the prices are high and I sell when the prices are down. But uh, this Superbird, yeah, I might make some money. If I ever do sell it, I'll make a little bit of money out. Sure, sure. That's, that's a matching numbers car, too. How many miles are under, Rick? Yeah, uh, a little over 50,000 original miles. It had, it had 45 when I bought it in the late 80s. You know, and I've taken it to shows over the year, and we'll take it out and drive it every once in a while. So it's a little over 50,000 now. What are, what are some of those other little neat trucks and Jeep-like vehicles I see in the pictures? What are those? Well... I'm not sure what you've seen. Uh, we've had some pickup trucks over the years. Uh, my girlfriend Donna, she's got a 55 Ford. Uh, I could fit in it, but it's a little tight, so mm -hmm. she doesn't want to be driving in there. Uh, wow, well, I, I don't know. I've, I've had a bunch of different cars over the years. Okay, any, any? Uh, I mean, is it just mostly Mopar, Plymouth, Dodge, or any Fords or General Motors products in there? Yeah, I've had a, uh, a GMC Typhoon, I a GMC Cyclone, uh, I've had Broncos, uh, I just recently bought a couple of Ram Chargers, I'm, I'm putting a, uh, a Hellcat engine in an 89 Ram Charger right now, that's one of my projects, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So that's keeping you hopping pretty good too. Rick, what's your schedule like for the rest of the summer? As far as motorcycle racing goes, where what are some races you plan on attending? Well, this year I'm, uh, I'm following the Northeast Series, and then I'm also catching some of the Mid-Atlantic Series. Uh, I'm trying to do all the hair scrambles, and then sometimes they'll, uh, they'll also have a second day or even the same day where they do the motocross. So that's what I'm trying to do now. Uh, there's still quite a few left. Uh, I think this next weekend we got one near Binghamton and Lawton, Pennsylvania. Sure. There'll be a uh, hair scramble Saturday, motocross Sunday, so I'm planning on doing that. And then uh, here and there, we'll catch a couple nationals. I guess there's a national up in uh, northern New York, Pavilion, New York. Mm -hmm. I'll be there. But I guess that's about it. Let's talk about your family for a minute, Rick. Do you have any relatives back in the Netherlands? Do you ever go back there? Yeah. Yeah, mom and dad are still there. And then uh, my sister's back there. My sister lived here for a while. She went to college in Oregon, then lived in Indiana for a while. Uh, but she, she moved back probably a good 10, 15 years now, back to the Netherlands. So I try to get back there as much as I can. And if not, my, you know, my parents come over here quite a bit. Yeah, that was my next question. I was wondering if you had brought them over here for a while and how they like it. Yeah, oh, they both love it. Uh, my dad, you know, he'll come for three months at a time. Usually when he comes, we'll, you know, we'll pick a project and you know, restore a bike. We've, uh, I let him do all the dirty work, you know, the polishing and the cleaning <laughs> and stuff. <laughs> yeah, and I do the easy work, just pick, you know, to get stuff back together. So what, yeah, he enjoys it. The, I got him in the motorcycles too. He's part of a club in the, in the Netherlands. And then yeah, they go out touring all the time. So he's, uh, yeah, he's a big motorcycle nut himself. That's great. And, and when, when you're racing these Northeast series, you, you have a house up there in Walton, so you just stay up there and you hit all the Northeast races? Yeah, yeah. I, uh, well, as I said, the, the Mid-Atlantic series, I went to a couple races uh, here 
over the last month there, you know, they're about five, six hours away. But everything else is usually within, you know, hour and a half to two hours or so. Sure. Sure. And, yeah. and what about your kids, Rick? I mean, you got a son and a daughter? Yeah, uh, daughter is, what is she, 28 now, 27, 28. So she works for the Pacers. She's back in Indianapolis. And uh, yeah, she really enjoys working for them. My son actually was playing basketball. He played in college. Then he went overseas and played in Spain. But he's back now, too. So he got back into racing. He used to go with me, you know, before he, uh, before he was taking basketball real serious, you know, before high school. Right. He, he used to go with me to all the uh, army events, and he did, you know, he did trials and stuff. And we did some local, you know, some local hair scrambles uh, on his little Honda 150. But then once he got to high school and, and basketball, became pretty serious. You know, we we really didn't let him race anymore. Now that he's done with basketball, he's he's picked it right back up, and he uh, we did some vintage racing in Arizona. And he went right out and kicked my ass. <laughs> you know, on, the, on the first time out, I was I was kind of embarrassed. I thought I you know I'd have something for him. You know, but, uh, it, Rick, it, it makes me ask the question: You've been in the motorcycles all your life. Did you ride dirt bikes in uh, during the off season when you were with the Pacers? Uh, I did. Mm-hmm. You know, you were you really weren't supposed to do it. Yeah. You know, if I'd have gotten hurt, they uh, they probably wouldn't have had to pay me. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I did. Actually, I had some four wheelers as well. And, and one summer, uh, my cousin and I had a cousin came up from the Netherlands pretty much every summer back then. We were out. We had these uh, Yamaha Banshees. You know, it's a it's a two stroke three fifty. Yes. And man, those things are wicked fast. And, mm-hmm. uh, of course, we you know, we did something we shouldn't have been doing, and uh, I ended up in the hospital. I, I don't remember that, that whole day. I woke up the next day in the hospital. So uh, I got lucky. You know, it was just a concussion and uh, got beat up a little bit, but uh, no no lasting effects uh, body wise. So, and that's uh, that's why you when you were under contract with the Pacers that happened. Yes, yes, that was yeah, it was not a good thing, but uh, as I said, I got lucky. Do you, I, I, didn't, do, I didn't miss any games. What season? What season was that? Do you remember? No, I'd have to look that up. I would. I, would, I think early nineties, ninety three, ninety four, maybe. Okay. Yeah, so I'm sure you can look it up. It, it was in the news. It was. It was all over the news back then. So. <laughs> hey, <laughs> it did, wasn't good, but oh do, well. Do you uh, do you stay in touch with Reggie Miller or Mullins or any of those guys? Uh, well, I'll occasionally see Reggie if, you know, he does a lot of announcing now. So uh, I used to go uh, to the Pacer games, so I'd see him there, you know, when he came in to announce a game. But uh, it's not like I, uh, you know, I call him and shoot the shit with him. Right. You know, it's, uh, he's, he's got his thing going on. And uh, actually, the last time I see him, here's kind of a funny story. I was doing a, uh, a motorcycle ride. Uh, big, have you heard of Big Bear? Yeah. Big Bear Dual Sport? Yeah, sure. So we're doing a big bear dual sport. It's uh, if you can do take an easy route or you can take the hard route. Just uh, was taking the hard route. You got 225 miles of trail, and you got to finish it in 13 hours. Mm. Oh, so I'm doing this, and all of a sudden I've seen all these mountain bikers coming, and they have their own race going on. They're going the other way, <laughs> and I had, I had heard that Reggie Miller got big in the mountain biking, and I I followed up on. Facebook or Instagram or whatever, and I'd seen, you know, he's got this this uh, this particular outfit that has a, you know, it's, it says Boom Baby on it, which was a thing that the Pacers announcer used to always say. Right. You know, he said every time he, Reggie made a three-pointer, he would say Boom Baby. And anyway, <laughs> so I'm looking at this guy, tall guy coming across the trail, and I was like, holy cow, I know that guy, I ended up being Reggie. <laughs> Uh, you know, he was in a race, and I was, you know, trying to finish my my thing. So, my, sure enough, you know, that later at night, I called and said, Reggie, that happened to be you right out there? And he said, sure enough, it was. <laughs> it ended up being his first podium finish. You know, he'd been, he'd been mountain biking, a mountain bike race for quite a while. This was his first finish, uh, podium finish. So, he was all stoked. Uh, that was the last time I seen him. And, well, and that's, that's amazing that you're on a motorcycle going one way, and he's on a mountain bike going the other. Yeah. You know, uh, Rick, I'm going to ask one more basketball question because some people have asked me. Uh, you, you played for, what, 10, 12 years with the Pacers? 12 years. 12 years. 
So you had to post up against some big guys, Patrick Ewing, Shaquille O'Neal. Who was the toughest as far as the center goes that you had to play against? Uh, well, the, the, the toughest, I always say, was Akeem Olajuwon because he was just so quick, mm -hmm. you know. He wasn't the biggest guy. You know, he probably only, I don't know, 6'9", 6'10", or so. But he was just so quick. He really was tough to handle. But then again, you know, Shaq being 300 plus pounds, right? You know, he he was he was tough to handle too because he's played he plays so physical. Mm. You know, and you know, with Shaq being an all star every year, you know, he can do whatever he wants. You know, you can take a, a, a charge on Shaq, you know, and let him run you over, but you'll get the foul. <laughs> <laughs> so you can't do that every time. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, he's he's a tough guy to move. You know, heck of a heck of a player down close to the basket. Uh, you know, but yeah, I guess the, the, between the two of them, you know, it, it, they're different. You know, you got to guard them differently, but they're both very tough to guard. Um, you've been involved in this motorcycle thing for so long. You, you buy and sell a lot of stuff. You, you know, you you wind up selling things. Then, well, not necessarily regretting it because at least you had it and then you sold it. Is there one bike or car out there? That you've been chasing that you haven't bought yet, or that you're still looking for the right one. Uh, I wouldn't mind having a um, a Wankel uh, Hercules. Oh, I thought uh, the uh, no, no, I'm sorry, the uh, the enduro version. Oh, okay. Get a couple different enduro versions. Uh, I know my buddy Kip Kern restored one for Moto Armory. Mm -hmm. And I forget now, I'm drawing a blank on who wrote it. Somebody wrote it in the six days. Uh, maybe Doug Wilford, but I'm not sure. Yeah, it's a, so it's a rotary engine, like the like the, uh, the W2000 road version I had, but it was an off-road bike. Okay, so you're still, you know, you're I, still chasing one of those. Yeah, I chased one. I had, a, I had a chance years ago to buy one from a guy in Canada. Of course, then, you know, I was, I was too cheap, and I didn't want to spend the money. <laughs> Looking back, you know, I should have bought it. And, you know, I've, I've, you know, I've been, I've always been kind of frugal. You know, I said, oh no, I think I could do better somewhere else. But you know, at the back, of course, I should have bought you know bikes when I had the chance. You yeah. know, well, when the time is right, you'll come across the next one and and oh, uh, yeah. you'll you'll pull the trigger. Modern racing, Supercross, Motocross. You watch it? You like it? Yeah, yeah, I, I like it all. Uh, you know. Uh, Indoor, outdoor, you know, the, the, the GP, MXGP, yeah. uh, I, you know, I like it all. Any favorite riders out there in Supercross yeah. or Motocross? Anybody you really like? Well, we actually, uh, we were family friends with uh, Jeffrey Hurling's family. Oh, okay. And dad. Yeah, they left relatively close. Uh, and uh, so we've been following him since he was on his, you know, little 65s. You know? So it was kind of cool to see, you know, him grow up and, and doing what he's doing now. A uh, heck of a rider, you know, unbelievably fast, you know, great family, too. Uh, yeah, so he's he's my favorite right now. Okay, and well, what about with Supercross, Motocross, American Riders? Anybody your favor? Uh, Tomac, uh, Tomac, I, I, Tomac, I, 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 I enjoy seeing them all, you know, I, I don't really have a favorite. I didn't, you know, I didn't. I don't, I haven't met any of, you know, met Ricky Carmichael a long time ago, mm -hmm. I like him, but that's, I think he's the only one I've, I've met. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I just uh, I enjoy watching it, and uh, that's about it, I guess. Well, Rick, I'm almost out of time for today, but I wanted to give you the opportunity to talk about any other clubs. Or, well, you kind of covered some of the clubs that you work with and some of the people uh, that you've helped with with tracks. But um, let's let's talk about this then. You've, you've raced all over the country with, with Armin Nationals. Um, what, what have been some of your favorite tracks? My, I always loved Moberly, Missouri. I always loved Crofton, Kentucky, too. What are some of the tracks that you liked out there as far as vintage races go? Uh, you know what? My, my, the one that stands out, well, uh, I've always liked KC, Illinois. Mm -hmm. uh, that used to be my favorite track for a long time. I also, Diamond Downs is always fun, but that's, you know, that's a whole experience, you know, to yeah. go to Diamond Downs. Yes, you know? yes. Um, the, the one track I became a better rider at was in uh, Monster Mountain, Alabama. Yes. For some reason, there was a jump there. You know, when I first got going to motocross, I was afraid to, you know, let it air out and jump and all that. And then for some reason, there was, there was an uphill jump there. And once I made that jump, I cleared that jump. 
then from then on, you know, I, I took leaps and bounds, you know, and yep. that, that always stuck with me. So I've only raced that once, but uh, I really like that track. You know, Ricky, a question just crossed my mind. I didn't really have it here in my notes. You're a guy that obviously physical fitness has been a huge, huge part of your life. Do you train for racing too, or is it just time on the bike? Or do you still run a little bit and work out? Yeah. Oh, no, I, uh, you know, we, we, we never covered. I actually did some, uh, you know, I did armor for about eight years. Mm -hmm. Then I went to modern bikes, uh, hair scrapples. I did the GNC series, you know, Indiana at the time had about five local series that come through the state that, that did modern hair scrapples. You know, we were racing Saturday and Sunday. And those days that I was doing the GNCCs, you know, I would train every day. Uh, you know, during the week, I would do at least one hour of, of some kind of a fitness and then weight lift. So yeah, I, uh, I'm, I'm too competitive just to go out there and get my ass well, <laughs> kicked, you know. Yeah. Even now, you know, I, I, I live on, a, on my uh, side of a mountain and I hike up the mountain, you know, three times a week, you know, just to be in somewhat of a you know, riding shape. Sure, well, it, it, you know, you do it for a couple of reasons too. You want to be competitive, but there's a whole lot less chance of getting injured if you're in better condition, so. Yeah, of course, yes, definitely, yeah. Well, Rick, is there anybody else you would like to thank today? Any sponsors? Anybody uh, you'd like to mention before we wrap up our interview today? Uh, let's see. Well, I I, uh, I already mentioned Don and Peg Miller. Yeah. They've always taken good care of me. Bob Rafkin. Uh, in the past, I've dealt with Clark. Plastics, the company gas tanks. Uh, uh, Larry Mills from DP Brakes. He's always been a, you know, taking care of me. He's always been sponsor uh rory o'neill from bridgetown tires in the past hooked me up <laughs> so good yeah, i guess that's about it uh if i forgot somebody i'm sorry uh <laughs> but uh yeah it's uh i've, I've really enjoyed my time uh with the village community you know i've, I've, I've always said I've, in the years of vintage racing i've made a lot more friends than i did in 12 years of playing in the nba <laughs> you know and I've, I've made a lot of lasting lasting friendships yeah getting, getting to know everybody well, my guest has been this morning, NBA great and vintage motocross enthusiast, Rick Smith. Rick, thanks so much again for taking time to talk to me. And uh, I hope to see you out on the trail one of these days. Thanks for having me, Joe. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Rick. Bye-bye. Oh, my guest this morning has been Rick Smith. I hope everyone enjoyed that interview. I learned a lot more about Rick than I, I certainly knew before. Vintage Motocross Radio is made possible with the help of Vinco. Keep the ride going with over 650 products in their catalog. Motion Pro for all your specialized tools, cables, and controls. Golan Products, check out their fuel filters online, and you can learn more about becoming a distributor for Golan Products. Full Circle Racing Limited for vintage and modern rims, spoke, lacing, and truing. Northwest Mako CZ, thank you, Alan Brown. Preston Petty Products, the legend continues, thanks to Paul Stainard. Racer X Magazine, available on your newsstand now. And, of course, online, Sunrise Vapor Blasting. Mark Ferriester of Modesto, California. And a special thanks to Kevin Bridges and Dirt Diggers North Motorcycle Club. Don't forget, the uh, Hangtown National will be coming up September 11th. Make plans to be there. It's going to be the last race of the season. And by the way things are stacking up, it looks to be, uh, to be a really, really great race at the end of the year. This is Joe Abadi. You've been listening to Vintage Motocross Radio. Don't forget to join me on Wednesday night for another episode of Vintage Motocross Q&A. Thanks for listening today. Enjoy the rest of it. We'll talk to you soon.